Welcome to Real Talk, History as a Weapon for Black Liberation. And I'm your host, Dr. Sundiata Kaita Chajua. And today I have with me uh, Dr. Jessica Millward, an exceptional young historian. So uh, Dr. Millward's specialty is uh, Black women during slavery across the African diaspora. And so today's program is going to focus on enslavement and resistance, identity formation, day-to-day -day resistance, and revolt across gender. There'll be an especial emphasis in talking about the different and similar ways in which Black men and women experience gender, as well as the ways in which um, African peoples experienced enslavement in the Caribbean and in the 13 British colonies that would become the United States, as well as South Central America. Now, Dr. Millward is the Inclusive Excellence Black Thriving Term Chair at the University of California, Irvine, where she is an associate professor in the Department of History and a core faculty member of African American studies. She is an expert on slavery, freedom, and Black women in early America. Dr. Millward's first book, Finding Charity's Folk, Enslaved and Free Black Women in Maryland, was published as part of the Race in Atlantic World series from the University of Georgia Press. An award-winning scholar, she publishes in the journal, she has published in the Journal of African American History, the Journal of Women's History, Souls, Frontiers, Palmaset, and the Women's History Review, as well as op-eds in the Chronicle of Higher Education, the feministwire.com, and the conversation.com. Millward is currently working on two book-length projects. The first discusses African American women's experiences with sexual assault and intimate, and intimate partner violence in the late 19th century. The second focuses on African American women in the slave dungeons of Ghana. Millward is also quite media savvy. She specializes in bringing histor and a historical perspective to modern times. That is to say, that in some ways she's uh, a presentist but she's always going to bring that long historical perspective. Now, along with Casey Callahan and Max Fear, Millward is co-founder of the podcast Historians on Housewives. Now, that's an intriguing title, right? This podcast examines the long-running Bravo franchise through, which, through the lens of historical scholarship. That is to say, it's looking at the housewives of Atlanta, the Housewives of New Jersey. And she's bringing a historical perspective to that, to those programs and an analysis. And she has a forthcoming edited volume, which focuses on the podcast analysis of various Housewives of series. Now with Tiffany Willoughby, Harold and Johanna Fernandez, Millward curates Activist Studio West, a digital repository of movement material. Now this archive documents the campaign to bring Mumia Abu-Jamal home. So it's very activist oriented. Dr. Millwood holds a PhD in history from UCLA. Indeed, she studied under the great Brenda Stevenson. She resides in California and Ghana. Okay, she's halfway out of here. We might want to take note as America continues to move in the wrong direction. Now, in addition to all of those things, Dr. Millward has also done some work as a comedian. And I have to say, in addition to being uh, quite intelligent, brilliant, I would say, she's also hellaciously funny. So, Dr. Millward. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Um, I don't know what I've walked into, but <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> I couldn't say no. I couldn't say no. Sundi Adachajua um, is known for giving me my first job in this thing called the academic profession. So I can't say no. I mean, in some ways you discovered Jay Mill, the person I've become. Uh, and what a person you have become. <laughs> a star. Rising. Rising. Still rising. Still rising. But I, I don't know that there's an apex for you. I oh, think thank you. Just be continuing to go. Thank you. So, it is, uh, like I said, I'm truly honored to have you. And I want to caution you to try and be succinct. We've only got 90 minutes, and you know how we academics like to talk, perseverate to some degree. So I want you to be succinct and also be aware that you know me. So I will interrupt. Uh, I will redirect. I will seek clarification. And sometimes I will pose challenges, right? So the first thing I got to do is this. I'm intrigued. What is the Black Thriving Term Chair? Well, Sundiata, it is I. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Prior, this is actually a project that was in, in, in place well before um, the world watched George Floyd uh, being murdered. Um, I don't call it the George Floyd moment. I call it what it is. We watched George Floyd uh, mm -hmm. uh, being murdered and some segments of society had a reckoning. But this uh, concept of Black thriving at UC Irvine has been in place since they hired me in 2008. And in the last, so I, I've, I've been here a long time. Yeah. And la it, within the last five years, Irvine has really made this concerted effort to um, recruit Black faculty, to um, retain Black faculty, to recruit Black graduate students and retain um, Black graduate students. So the Black Thriving Initiative is um, comes out of the Office of Inclusive Excellence. Um, I'm an inaugural chair. I'm part of a cohort of four other people that for the next three years were given lavish research money, um, like what I would call like the, Irvine, the, the Illinois research money. <laughs> lavish back, research back, money. back in the day, yes. Back in the so day. That's how you are uh, commuting between Ghana and California. Yes. Two great places. Wow. Well, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing my research, so let's not just say uh, I'm commuting. I, 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 I know you're a serious hard worker, but right. Ghana came before the Black Thriving, but it makes doing the research a lot easier. And so Black Thriving is like a, a multi-pronged project at Irvine to increase Black uh, attendance, Black faculty, and most importantly, Black retention. Good. And, and, and I gather that some of the other California schools have similar programs now, but they don't have such an intriguing title, an empowering right. title. It is an empowering title. I mean, I think that from where I came in 2008 to where we are now, okay, there's a time where I would have said Black Thriving and said, mm, was that sarcastic? I mean, is that, what is that? But I would say now um, there's enough infrastructure that um, I believe it or not, I think that behind what they call the Orange Curtain in Orange County, California, mm. is a pretty good place to come and, and work and um, and do things <laughs> I'm on camera. I'm live. <laughs> and, do you things, and do things that are actually not solely centered around Afro pessimism. UC Irvine's African American mm -hmm. Studies program has, uh, you know, Frank Frank uh, Wilderson, yeah. who's who theory on black pessimism. He doesn't believe. You know, my 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 uh, signature at the end of all my emails is I uh, took it from uh, Jamil Alameen, H. Rap Brown, Lassama Tutashinde and Bilashaka. We will win without a doubt. He doesn't share that view. Yeah, we could talk about Afro-pessimists all day long. What I will say is for me, what it does not do is show how African-Americans were able to survive. It doesn't leave space for life. Yeah. So and it doesn't that's what provide but um, despite Barack Obama's misuse of it, people need hope and people respond yes. to hope. Yes. Yeah. 
So that's a long story of saying that's how it became the Black Thriving Care at UC Irvine. It's been a long history. I mean, you could say that I'm getting research funds because I'm going to change the shape of the institution. I some days I think it's back pay. It was a hard few years. <laughs> With but, another name for back pay. Yes, I you say it's back pay, but it is what it is. <laughs> yes, but that's that's good, and I'm, I'm I'm pleased to hear that. Now, Jessica, you also have a very interesting personal biography. So I always begin the show with I know. Uh, asking. <laughs> biographical questions, right? I want to explore how my guests' social and political background. So can you discuss how you became the Jessica Millward of op-eds, of two podcasts, a thriving intellectual? And I'm particularly interested in, if you can talk about class background, Talk about the place you, you grew up in and talk about the, the era, the time period. And you're somewhat familiar with Bill Cross's Negrescence theory. So to the extent that you can, put it in that context and uh, let's let the audience know who you are. So I was born on the west side of Salt Lake City, Utah, the, the hard streets of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I am biracial. My father's from Ogden, Utah, and my mother worked from a small town uh, called Lehigh, Utah, which is not a slow, salt, small town anymore. So I grew up biracial in Salt Lake City, Utah in the 1970s and 80s. I will give you an anecdote. When I first visited Mumia Abu Jamal for the first time, here's a man who st stared down several, several death warrants, right? And his, his, the, the, literal cost on his head. Now, tell us what year that you, you first visited him. Oh, I feel like it was 2013. Okay. Because I had just turned 40. Don't do the math. But I visited him and he was ready to talk. He had done his research on Salt Lake City. He was ready to talk. And then one of the first things he said to me was, you grew up biracial in Salt Lake City. Yes. In a Mormon family. I did. He said, how did you survive? <laughs> <laughs> and I look around, and we're in a, 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 a in prison, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, thought, yeah. Wow, that's deep. That's deep. And I just turned it on him and said, "No, really." I think the question is, "How did you survive?" So, I was raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, you know, there are not a lot of black people. There's a Sesame Street song I think called "One of These Kids Is Not Like the Other." Yeah, I always yeah, feel like yeah. I'm singing that song. Um, I think my kind of radicalness, my radicalization came like it does for many college students in, in college, your first year of college, your second year of college, um, you, you know, you start questioning everything. I, believe it or not, received a BA degree in African American studies, a minor in African American studies at the University of Utah, if you can imagine. I then went to UCLA um, and did an MA in African American Studies and then a PhD in U.S. History. Okay, so, but where did the, the drive I don't to know. do Black Studies come from out of Salt Lake City? No. And, 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 uh, at least one of your parents was a, was a Mormon, right? Yes, my mother. Okay. So it's, it's kind of, um, I wish I had the answer for you. It wasn't like, oh, I must learn more about myself. It, it wasn't that one day. Well, I guess it was one day I found a copy of um, uh, I Know Where the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Mm. I said, who was this? And then I devoured all of her books. Then at some point along the way, I stumbled. I don't even know how I stumbled upon George Jackson. And you're still in high school, right? I'm in high school. Okay. Doesn't everyone read these books in high school? What, what, so let what, me go what, back. I said what, college. You say that you found school. one of George Jackson's book, Blood in My Eye, or? I think it was. Does he have a poetry book? I haven't done the 20th century in so long. Um, does he have a book of poems? He's got, he's got a book. Soledad Brother. Brother. I had Soledad Brother. You had Soledad Brother. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah at a used uh, bookstore in Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay, that's what I was going to say. Where the hell you find George Jackson? A used Soledad bookstore. Brother in, in, in Salt Lake City. I, I, I used bookstores. So that introduced me to Angela Davis. That introduced me to so many things, so many things. And by the time I got to college, 
I actually intended to be a Afro-Am lit major. That's what I intended to be. Ooh. And I was a complete nerd. I decided to be a historian because well, soon to I need a historical background if I'm going to write historical literature. So and then, and then we won you over. <laughs> won me over. I decided to think like facts matter. Yeah, they do. You know, facts it's, it's interesting in that way, isn't it? It is interesting in that way. Um, I don't think you could ever call me a, a, a an activist like in the street. I don't. Right. I don't feel like that is my gift. Um, that that's not my gift. I think my my activism comes in the classroom. My activism comes in getting students into academic institutions, keeping them here with money, um, shaping future generations of activists. But I don't necessarily think my gift is 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 marching and right. organizing. Right. I mean, my good friend of mine is Johanna Fernandez. That is her gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is not my gift. But so we're you're more the line of uh, producing scholarship that can be useful yes. to the movement. Yes. And I'm honest about that. I don't, I'm not embarrassed to buy it. I don't, no, I'm poor. I couldn't get arrested that many times. So I'm not, I'm not going to go to jail over an issue. Who's going to come get me? <laughs> so let, let, let me, let me roll back here though. Because uh, the project with uh, Abu Jamal, you you are engaged in doing more than just documenting his life, right? So, so talk about that project, because I'm sensing that there's some activism involved in that project. Well, there's a little activism. So the way the project came about is, I I, I literally was talking to. Um, uh, Mumia and Johanna one day about where his papers resided because someone was going to want his papers and many people wanted to use them for free. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm a capitalist. That's no, 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 no. I said, don't do that. Wait until someone can buy them. So in between um, then and now, so an institution has bought them and I'll wait till there's a press conference about that. It's not my institution, but in between, there was no one documenting not the Free Mumia movement, but actually this new generation of scholars, the campaign to bring Mumia home. Mm -hmm. this, this, this generation of scholars who are really um, involved in advocating, freeing Mumia isn't enough. We need to envision Mumia being home. And um, I, I like to say I'm the unofficial spiritual advisor um, because I will say things like, no, you, you can't do that. You, ju you just can't do that. But in general, there is an activist component. We are documenting the activists. So I run a summer program with HBCU students that come virtually to UCI. It was supposed to be physically, but COVID. So we're in the third year of a project that has been working with HBCU students and digital and teaching them aspects of digital humanity so they can document this history that's being produced that the activists themselves don't actually have time to document. Okay, good. Now, I, I do want to, there's something you said that I just wasn't aware that um, you were now the owner of some major corporation or engaged in some large banking enterprise. Am uh, I? You, de you described yourself as a capitalist. Oh, no, 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 not a capitalist someone. that way. No, not a rich capitalist. No, 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 no. no. You, you're an individual who wants to be paid for their labor. Yes, I like nice things. Yeah. Uh, yes, like I like, nice yes, things. exactly. It doesn't make us part of the bourgeoisie. Okay. You know, remember the, the the goal is to bring all of us up to the quality of lifestyle of theirs as opposed to us uh, uniting around scarcity. Yes. Yeah. yeah yes. So in the in the case of Mumia and his pay, his documents, absolutely not. There needs to be, you know, there needs to be the right person to um, oversee them. Or the right institution, and it needs to be money that can go to his family or and and himself when he's released. Okay. So that's what I mean by capitalist. I was like, oh no, no, just don't yeah, give him to yeah, anybody. Yeah, don't, 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 don't say that. That ain't what you're doing. You know, okay. for 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 so long, um, this the, the the capitalists have taken our labor and the products that we produced, our intellectual production. Uh, from music to everything, and reaped, you know, billions off of it, and uh, we died poor and broke. You don't say. 
<laughs> you know, so no, no, but uh, no, I'm not a capitalist. You, you what I'm saying is, I felt that he should be paid for absolutely, he paid well for it, and paid well, and paid well. And paid well. well. Absolutely. Okay, let's, um, you know, there's a quote that I took from one of your articles, and I think it's a good place to start in terms of uh, you detailing more of what you do as a historian, right? And so th this quote, I don't even know if you remember it, you know, you produce so much, but this, this quote is, you became a historian to reclaim the lives of those viewed as insignificant. Now, clearly that's embodied in the M Mumia project, but even less so because Mumia uh, became a famous activist called Celebre. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about people that are this quote unquote unsung. Mm -hmm. So what attracted you to uh, the people that America believed they could dispose of, that they could write out a history? Well, in fact, not even write us out, never write us in. Never write us in. Yeah. So, so I think this goes back to your original question about um, basically how did my upbringing shape shape my scholarship, and I think primarily being raised, um, you know, in a Mormon household, being biracial, not really ever being seen, mm. not ever being seen, coming in this place of being both hyper visible and not visible at all. I think it shaped the way I then looked at looked at history. And so I'm looking for, or I'm gifted with the ability to find people that other people might not be looking for. I mean, it's- You, you got your voices, uh, seven sight behind the veil. Yes, yeah. I do my research, I know what I'm talking about, but I really feel like it, it, it is kind of this multi, this position of being seen and unseen at the same time mm -hmm. that makes me want to advocate for um, those people either in historical documents or in some case conference panels that might be overlooked. I'm always looking, I love the underdog, you know this, you worked with me. I mean, we would have votes that never lined up, but I'd be like, but the underdog, look at the underdog. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think that that influenced how I look at the historical record. You know, my first book looked at a woman who was well known in Annapolis, Maryland, but not known in the historical record. Um, she was an enslaved woman who managed to work her way to freedom um, right after the American Revolution. And she was smart. She put, well, of course the owners want, wanted to at that point, put uh, limits on what age you could free people at, et cetera, et cetera. But she was smart. Somehow behind the scenes, charity folks negotiated for her freedom, her children's freedom, and even her grandchildren's freedom in perpetuity. Mm. So, and I don't think that just came from uh, um, a benevolent owner who said, let me, you know, look out for this woman. I think there had to be negotiating in the back background. So yeah. all this part about being invisible, you know, enslaved people, as you know, appear in ledger books. They appear next yeah. to cattle. Next to the animals. Yeah. Next to the animals. And, you know, and at the same time they appear and they're praised like animals. There's all kinds of uh, writings in the ledger book saying, you know, I had a t hard time with Kofi today. His 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 tools continue to break, mm -hmm. or um, you know, a per 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 perpetual runaway slave. So yeah. there's also action that's going on in these in these planter manuals. And then you know, we have things like the WPA, the Works Projects uh, right. Administration, interviews where you know people went out to interview former slaves. And as you know, you're a historian. The argument is these sources are great, but can we trust them because they were being interviewed by white people who may have had some kind of relationship to the farm they were just enslaved on? So I look for those loopholes. I look for mm -hmm. kind of what isn't spoken. Okay. Those gaps as well as uh, reading against the grain. Reading against the grain. I don't necessarily think I would call it critical fabulation as Sadia Hartman calls it. Um, I, yeah. I I, I, I wouldn't call it that um, Good. because I was trained by someone who said it would have been easy for me to say it's not there. And I was trained by someone who said, yes, it is. Go find it. And if it isn't there, let's talk about why it's not there. Good. And that's the difference between historians and uh, other people. Yes. Other disciplines. So 
I want to move toward a, a kind of general comment about enslavement. Yes. So what do we learn about enslavement, resistance, perseverance uh, during the enslaved period of charity folks life, but also during her period of quasi freedom? And I'm taking that term quasi freedom from John Hope Franklin, mm -hmm. who was pointing out that uh, these folks couldn't testify in court, couldn't vote, couldn't, you know, a lot of, they couldn't. That's right. they're not completely free in the white sense, right? So right. can you talk about what you learn about perseverance and resistance uh, from her life and how that gives you a window onto uh, the ways in which we survived, as you say, survived enslavement and uh, continuing racial oppression um you know what can't you learn from charity folks what can't you learn is the question i would say in terms of enslavement um we know that she had four possibly five children as a slave um i say five because there's a court record that talks about um her son james being one of the her favorites of her boys but when she comes into freedom, she only has James and she has uh, four other four other children. I'm sorry, I said she, she had four children in slavery. She, she had five we know about. Okay. She had five that we know about. Um, and, and so- how, what, uh, how many years apart are they? Do they fit that pattern that slave masters liked every two years? As Thomas Jefferson they, said, they the do. best investment is a black child born every two years. They, they more or less do. Yeah, they more or less do. So, um, I'm sorry, the ancestors are sitting on my shoulders right now. Let me just do my math really quickly. Let me make sure I didn't tell you wrong. It, she might have had five children. There's a slippage in terms of language for one daughter. If it's her name's Harriet or if her name was Hannah, I maintain that she had four daughters, one son that we know about. So from the time that Charity Folks has given freedom or promised freedom legally to the time that her grandchildren are manumitted was 40 years. Ooh. 40 years that a family is, is, you know, waiting, negotiating, maybe buying down, buying down the price on someone's uh, um, bondage, indentured is not the word I'm looking for. Charity folks, in terms of an enslaved person, we don't know much about her. And I feel in that way, she's a metaphor for so, a, so of some, like so many other Black women in right. the historical record. Um, that doesn't mean that she didn't experience pain, loss, suffering, but we don't know a lot about her experiences as an enslaved person because we don't have her own record. So I have, when is she born and how many years is she enslaved? And you're talking about the period around the uh, U.S. War yes. of uh, Independence. So let me back up. Thank you for thank you for being a historian and anchoring me. She was born, we think, in in 1757. She was alive during the American Revolution. Um, her owner actually was a very uh, prominent colonial power. He he was the stamp collector for the crown mm. and a barrister. Um, it's believed that he went into hiding during the American Revolution because, well. He didn't want to be tarred and feathered. He was in Annapolis. There's a long history of them um, taking. He's a Tory. <laughs> yes, he's a Tory. And so it's believed that she actually uh, stayed and managed the home and was, you know, the absentee boss while the family was hiding somewhere. Um, I also will say that she lived across the street from Charles Carroll Carrollton, or I'm sorry, she was enslaved across the street from Charles Carroll Carrollton the only Catholic mm -hmm. to sign the Declaration of Independence and one of the largest slaveholders in the state of Maryland. So she was, she and another slave often went back and forth um, to house, between households. So she learned a lot. I'm assuming she learned a lot about what was going on with the war. Um, I would like to believe she learned about Dunmore's proclamation that offered mm -hmm. freedom in 1775 to anyone who picked up arms against the British. So she was in this kind of environment. Um, there's no doubt that she probably had interaction with someone like Benjamin Franklin who came to the home 
We know that uh, George Washington visited across the street at Charles Carroll Carrollton. So she literally was with these revolutionaries. Yeah. <laughs> and what I would argue is when we think about resistance and slave resistance, it's often armed rebel rebellion yeah. or it's po po poisoning owners. Uh, you know, flight, yeah. Flight. There might be something to say, say for staying in place because you are trying to survive every single day and, 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 and manipulate things in the background. There is evidence that she came from a little bit of privilege. Um, in now, that what you mean being a house that servant? She was, the, she was a slaveholder's child. Okay. Um, <laughs> I argued that she was descended from a gentleman named Benjamin Tasker Jr. Um, who was at that point, this, she, you know, let me back up, who was a prominent slaveholder in Virginia. Um, he came to Maryland to mine the plantation when his brother-in-law, who had been the governor of Maryland, passed away. So Charity Folks was raised in the house of a governor. She then was sent to live with this prominent Tory because he married the governor's daughter. So she was around politics a lot. Um, but she was very close to the woman who owned her her entire life, Mary Ogle, who had been the governor's daughter. Um, one could argue that she was um, basically cousins to cousins to Mary Ogle. Like, let me actually not, I'm dancing around it because some of the Maryland historians got mad at me, but I actually now have DNA proof because some of Charity's descendants did the DNA test and guess what? I was right to begin with. Okay. So they had a relationship, but she had a relationship where um, her owner promised her upon his death um, um, sp money, Spanish dollars. When when mm. Mary Rideout died, Mary who becomes Rideout, Mary Rideout died. She left her clothes and a feather bed, so she was a little bit more privileged when she walked into freedom. Well, you, you know, one of the things we have to be very very clear about, you know, Celar James and what I think is the greatest book ever written, Black Jacobins. Yes, he talks about the ways in which all of the leaders of the revolution had somewhat privileged positions. Tucson was a buggy driver. Mm -hmm. And without being in that position where he wasn't in the field, he wouldn't have been able to go around the island and learn and make contacts and set the revolution. And so James concludes that uh, people who lead revolutions often are part of the oppressed that benefited somewhat, right, from the oppression. So you know, that's par for course. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of perseverance and phenomenal planning, 40 years of struggle to get the grandchildren free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, she, and she didn't, she didn't petition her, she didn't petition for freedom. This came about f from her interpersonal relationship with her owners, whatever that means. Um, so sexual manipulation? In a, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. I wouldn't be, based on what we know, yeah. based on what we know, she came into the right out home at 12 or 13 years of age. Um, she knew her mistress because she'd grown up with her, but she didn't know the, she didn't know the man that she married, which was John right out. They also had uh, young boys in the house at that time. It doesn't take much it doesn't take you to know much about the enslaved experience or to know mm -hmm. that she was in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. That's right. And she's got to use her wits to figure mm -hmm. out how she can survive and create a path. Right. To free. Right. Now, the, a, a great story about her is at least two of her children. I'm getting to the great part. At least two of her children um, were, were, we don't know who the father was. They claim it was some local lures. It was some man named Jackson who ran away. <laughs> I have been through the slave records in Maryland and Virginia. Jackson is not a common name in 1790 when the children were born, 1780. It's not a common name in Virginia at that time, but it's convenient family uh, narrative to say that she had a husband named Jackson who ran away. Okay. Um, she does have, as she's enslaved, she meets up with an enslaved man who eventually buys his own freedom. His name is Thomas Folks, and they have children together. Okay. 
And How so many they, children do they have? They end up having two together. Okay. Uh, they end up having two together. So there is this, you know, we can say there's this moment where, you know, she did have choice. Yeah. yeah. She, had, she had choice and they're all buried um, next to each other in the family plot in Annapolis. So, you know, I think that I'm, it's a long way of saying that when we, we have Orlando Patterson, Africans come to the world and they're kinless. They come to the new world, they're kinless and they're stateless. <laughs> So you My know, address. Orlando Patterson is the precursor to Afro-pessimism. Right. So then yeah, my, undergrad yeah. students come in and say, my undergrad students come in and say, what about Orlando Patterson? What about Orlando Patterson? I will, I will accept kinless for a moment. I will accept kinless for a moment in the transition from Africa to the Americas because everyone is jumbled up, but there were common languages because we know they took people from the same area. Um, People are separated from their family. So I say for a moment, we also know that Black people are resilient. They automatically started uh, developing fictive ties to one another. Let me, let me raise a, a question here, right? Um, there's much data that suggests that probably 30% were captured through raids on their village, which is to say then they're capturing people who are members of extended families, right? And maybe 34% were captured through a kidnapping. And that might be individuals that you could say are on a ship and kinless, but those folks who are captured through raids on villages. They already um, know each other. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that, that just don't make sense. Yeah, this isn't the Roots narrative where they go and they pluck literally one person. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's not how it happened. It was strategic. Participating in the slave trade was strategic. So this kinlessness, I say, mm, I don't really buy it. Yeah. I don't really buy it. And so I, I argue that family is one of the most important kind of resistive strategies, mm -hmm. resistive units, resistive legacies we have coming from slavery. Unlike Daniel Moynihan, the senator who, what in the day, 1965, said that, you know, this tangle of pathology the Black families find themselves in is all the Black woman's fault. It's yeah. all the Black woman's fault. I actually thought about that when I was looking at women like charity folks who were freed with children. And we don't have any reference to any men because the status of the child followed that of the mother. Mm -hmm. It's right. not that there weren't black men present, but so the we, child, we know that they were present, right? We know I mean, they were present. Right? We know they were present. That in the we know they were present because they wouldn't be here. But <laughs> they're in the same hut. Yeah, So black men are written out. This I will say the black men are written out of the national fabric. Yeah. Of how the U.S. defines family. That's what I'll say. But I think that family is an enduring. Uh, uh, legacy survivalism, despite all odds, from That's slavery. Right. That's right. Now, Jessica, you know, um, th th there must be forces in the universe that are mocking us right now, because something just popped up on my um, screen. Facebook is listening. Kevin Samuels on interracial relationships. Now, I had never heard of this individual until uh, from a student uh, about a week ago. So I've spent the last week looking at very short clips. This is uh, insanity. This is when, when Bill Cross said that, yes, there are some black folks who hate us and hate themselves. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm not going to speak bad of the dead, but I will say that I was not a fan. I will also say, you know, I did some actual some digging with Kevin Samuels yesterday. I did some digging. I went probably deeper than TMZ. There's a 911 mm -hmm. tape where a nurse was helping him, but it sounds like they might have been a little bit more involved. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that. I just did some round just roundabout digging yesterday. I found myself in a rabbit hole. So you were going to say something about Kevin Samuels and I was supposed to respond to his ideas and notions. No, no, no. It, it was just ironic to me that as you were saying about the role of black women and, and building family and preserving family, up pops this thing saying Kevin Samuels. 
You know they're listening. You of all people know that people are listening. You of all people know they're listening. They are definitely out there to mess up our day. So yes. Okay. Uh, so I don't think I answered nearly half of your question. Run it back by me. What what else can I answer of that? Very. Well, I, I, I just question. wanted you to, to highlight forms of resistance. You did that somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also wanted you to put it in context of the difference around gender mm -hmm. and also to talk about the uh, African diaspora, the Atlantic world side of the African diaspora and different forms of resistance. Yeah. Uh, and again, amongst men and women, so that sure. we get a more complete picture. Well, as you know, um... Africans resisted enslavement from the moment the shackles were put on them, from the moment they were taken from their villages. Um, I don't call um, the individuals who were kidnapped, and I'm sure you share this with me, they're not slaves until they, they end up in the, the new world. They're not, you know, they are treated horribly, inhumanely, but they are responding to, I'm coming back to why I say they're not slaves until they get to the new world. Um, there's a, there's a, a often arguments that, or you hear this from people who don't do slavery. We talk about the slaves that were taken from Africa. They weren't, they weren't necessarily slaves. Right. Some, some, some might've been, Small but, they weren't necessarily, so. but they weren't chattel slaves as we know That's them. Right. So they weren't necessarily slaves. So um, I think as Stephanie Smallwood does a good job of this, talking about how they go from captives to commodities. Um, but even as captives to commodities, we know from the, very early work of Eric Taylor, people were resisting on the slave ships. Men might be under the decks, um, planning a rebellion. If you think about Marcus Rediger's book, not Marcus Rediger. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, Marcus Rediger, the yeah, ship. Marcus Rediger about the slave ship. But then yeah, he, has, yeah. he talks the about the ship. Pearl Society. He yeah. has a bit, he does an Amistad rebellion and he talks about the Pearl Society. There were warriors that were off on the ship, the Amistad, that were communicating back and forth. And that's how they were able to overtake the ship. It goes back to your point. People are being taken from certain villages. They're being raided. So there's a community of people that probably know each other. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting some back talk. How about that? In the same, uh, I mean, they're probably in the same uh, secret societies. Exactly. And I think people miss that. So we have men aboard slave ships under under um, the decks, you know, chained together, planning whether or not they're all going to jump off the, sh the ship when they're chained together. You know, there's been enough work done that we know that, unfortunately, women were allowed up above decks. They were washed clean only to be violated. But this also then put them in positions where they could yes. hear things. Mm hmm they could, they could steal things. They could steal things. things. Yeah. They could see things. Mm -hmm. So they were in these pivotal roles, right? That we often don't understand. People get to the new world, they're literally in a land they don't know. Resistance and rebellion and revolution, I feel, exist on the same continuum. Mm -hmm. right? right? So you have resistance, which is, you know, uh, maybe peeing in the cotton. Uh, my my father always likes to say sh shitting in high cotton. Is that the, the term shitting in high cotton? Yeah, yeah. And I had to break it down. I'm like, do you understand that that's that's African American resistance? He's like, what are you talking about? I said it's not just a saying. They would they would defecate and urinate on the cotton, so it would weigh more yeah, at the yeah. farm, and by the time it dried out, it weighed less at the market, and their owner didn't get as many profits. Um. So there's those kind of things. There's the obvious poisoning, setting fire to things. Um, you know, it's been argued that men had more mobility because they might be blacksmiths or they might be, you know, they had these professions they could be hired mm -hmm. out. So they would travel and see different things and relay messages, right? Um, and I think that the work by Vanessa Holden and a few other people, um, Rebecca, Rebecca Hall, if you didn't already, if you weren't already invested in, in black women having a presence in these rebellions, the work of those two will show you that there's multi-layered roles that women took. And it's very interesting how we remember them as well. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of gendered 
resistance, obviously black women and black men, well, we want to say that black women were brutalized, which they were, but not enough work has been done on black men who were sexually assaulted as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. The WPA narratives don't tell us that, but we know from Linda, Linda Brandt, Harriet Jacob, who was Harriet Jacobs, her novel that at least one person was, uh, one male was uh, uh, sexually violated. Mm -hmm. So when you're in those intimate spaces, you are more willing to do other things like, one of my favorite stories from the WPA narratives, I forgot her name, but she cut off someone's unit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Celia Slave, right? Celia Slave, this young girl who had been raped from mm -hmm. about 12 to 19. Uh, she finally had her limit. And when they started looking for her owner, they only found him because something smelled funny in her cabin. That's she right. had chopped that joker up. She chopped him up. Burned him, put him in the put him in the the, the oven, and was trying to burn him. Yeah. So there's also these moments of of the courage it must have taken. I mean, when you do something like that, you know, you're you, there was only two ways some revolts were going to end: death, that's right, slowly, or death quickly. I think Nat Turner is a perfect example of death slowly. Nat yeah. Turner, you know, he galvanized a group of enslaved people and free blacks. They moved through Southampton. Um, he evades capture for how long, Sundiata? Like three, six weeks? <laughs> yeah, about six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. And he's in the Almost swamp. two months. Yeah, so he's in yeah. the swamps doing the great, the other kind of uh, uh, resistance, the maroonage, where you mm -hmm. flee and, and no one can find you, one, because you're armed. But in Nat Turner's case, he knew the swamps and right. someone was helping him hide. But when they caught him, um, who was this gentleman? Vincent, not Vincent Brown, Vincent Coretta. The book, he did a, he did a book on Nat Turner, but he talks about, um, and then he passed away the Vincent. Mm -hmm. He passed away. I can't remember his name. But he talks about the way in which uh, Southerners, Virginians, boiled down uh, Nat mm -hmm. Turner's oh, yeah. and used his body fat. Oh, yeah. For grease. Absolutely. For grease. They skinned him. I mean, the whole damn and then line. Dinah Ramey Berry talks about how his skull has just been located and it's been returned to the family. Yeah. Um, you know, he's an example of a long death. Like, if you talk about the afterlife, mm -hmm. you know his soul really didn't probably hasn't even found rest now. And, and, and they knew that when they were torturing him to death, they, they wanted to make an example. So I, so resistance, rebellion, revolution, it's all on the same framework. And, you know, more than likely the punishment was going to be at best whipped, maybe sold and certainly death somewhere in between. And probably mutilated. Mu absolutely. Possibly mutilated. Yeah. Yes, so, if you look at so, some of those torture instruments they put on people, oh, oh yeah. definitely yeah. mutilation, if not just like, you know, cutting off a, a leg so they can't run away. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the multiple ways in which men and women resisted is, is uh, fascinating. And I would imagine that we're still going to uncover multiple ways. So here's a question that I, I, I want to uh, try and figure it out a little bit more. Sure. And this is on the development of identity. So we come here from hundreds of African ethnicities. Like uh, I think it's, is it uh, Hall? There's a book on Louisiana. Uh, oh, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall. Yeah, yeah, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall. Rebecca Hall's Hall. mother, oddly enough. Oh, okay. Hmm. And you know, she was married to Harry Haywood at that yes. moment. Yes. Yeah. For any yeah. students listening or watching, that's why the footnotes matter. Acknowledgements yeah. and the introduction matter. That's so, right. Yeah, so yeah, Gwendolyn Midlow right. Hall talks about the Bambara, right? Uh, well, not just the Bambara. She talks about that uh, in New Orleans. The, the records show that there were 215 different ethnic, ethnicities in the that that were uh, you know taken from the ships. 215. 
215 just in Louisiana. So once we extend this, uh, you know, we're, we're talking hundreds of different ethnicities. You know, for some reason, people tend to, I don't know about your student, but my students, I have to remind them several times a semester that Africa is a continent, the second largest continent. And there are about 55 nation states, but there are 800 different ethnicities, speaking 900 languages. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, you have to, so we could be talking 500 different ethnicities on these plantations. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to try and get at is what is the process by which these hundreds of African ethnicities become the African American or the Haitian or the Jamaican, right? What is that process? How does that work? Well, I think that when we think about the Haitian or the Jamaican, just titles alone, we need to look at nation state and how, you know, Jamaica is Jamaica because that is a particular, you know, independent nation now. Haiti is an, in Saint-Domingue, which was owned by the French, is now an independent nation called Haiti, right? Um, I know where you, where, you, where you want me to go with this. I'm trying to do due diligence to it. I know in the t case of Africa, America, there's particularly colonial America, there's, you know, there's, Scholars like the late Sylvia Fry and Betty Wood who talk about Christianity was the moment that brought all these different nations together, but that doesn't account for Muslims who were still being brought into the country and practiced their faith, <laughs> right? right. Uh, people are baptized as soon as they leave um, um, Elmina or Cape Coast, or they're mm -hmm. baptized before they leave. That yeah. doesn't, that's not the moment. Christianity isn't the moment. You know, someone like Michael Gomez talks about is this moment in resistance where you you shake your you shake your country marks and you come together as a unified mm -hmm. body. And I would say that it was in those moments surviving slavery together that that Africa America is formed. Um, you know, and there's cultural. I mean, cultural creolization. Yes. I, I really wasn't trying to drive you to an answer. I was just trying to get us to bathe in your insights. Well, let's bathe in, you know, you, you might have told me a story about people thinking that, you know, anyone can be called an African, or especially people in the U.S. might consider themselves African. As any African, any of African from any country in Africa, right, because Africa's yeah. country is not continent, as any African will tell you, and as any Black person who's gone to Africa will tell you, Africans know that you're American. Africans know that you're Jamaican. As soon as they see you. As soon as they see you. You know, this, in, in Ghana, they use the term Obruni for outsiders. Yeah. And, you know, um, me and my significant other go back and forth about this term a lot. A lot. And I was like, no, you don't understand why it's offensive coming from African America to, mm -hmm. to, to Ghana that's supposed to be the safe haven. That's another story. That's not what you asked. You're look, about look, but, but no, since you did that, in Tanzania, they have something that's even um, more offensive. They call us 50 cents. Not like, the, <laughs> you know what I mean? We half of what they were. And in Nigeria, what is it? Uh, uh, it's, it's a term that, that means cotton picker. So, wow. so yeah. Well, in know, Ghana, they will strong. say, in Ghana, they'll say, don't worry, I'm not going to sell you. What? And first I, time I heard, I thought it was a fluke. I thought it was just someone not knowing. Like, I thought it was a fluke. The second or third time I heard it, I had to stop, in this case, the person who was talking to me and say, do you understand why that's offensive? I mean, do you have any guilt when you say that? Like, it's not funny. It's not funny to so many of us that come back to the continent. But so, yeah, there's there's divides. The point is, yeah. Africa is a continent, <laughs> various countries. And when you go from America or Jamaica to, or Haiti, you're aware that you're not, quote unquote, African. Yeah. Now, in terms of regional variations, you know, I think it depends on it depends, obviously, on the colonial power that was holding, um, 
you know, groups of people. That's why in Brazil, we have, you know, not everyone speaking English because why? The Portuguese. Um, Haiti has a different history than, say, um, the French Antilles because of the mm -hmm. colonial power. I think it also, uh, uh, based on the kind of crop you were harvesting, would change, Absolutely. Would change your Absolutely. life. Are you doing sugar in Jamaica where they worked you until you died and didn't believe in natural uh, repopulation or natural reproduction? Or are you working in the British colonies who, you know, same same name, same colonial power, but in the U.S., what becomes the U.S., they realize that natural reproduction might be a way to keep enslaved people in place. That's right. And certainly after 1808, 1808 you can't just keep going to the continent and bringing people, you know, right. this fact about Haiti, you know, that the average enslaved person in Haiti lives seven years. They literally work people to death yeah. Then they just run to the continent and get some more. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, this is, we're talking a brutal, brutal regime. If you want to talk about a point where black lives did not matter, except for profit, yeah. except for profit. Um, sure. Yeah, so I think colonial power, um, the kind of crops you were producing, all of this produces a, a differing experiences in the diaspora, but there's also real commonalities, as you yes, know. Yes, yes. The talk, drums to, talk about the commonalities. The drums, always important for socializing. And, and the banjo. The banjo. I didn't get there yet. The banjo. Okay, I, I'll give you the space to stretch out. No, Let me no, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. You've got years in this game. You that's where I got you here. Game. Go. We've got, we've got food ways. We got, you know, um, uh, gosh, I don't want to say greens. That's not the word. I, that's not even where I was going with that. I was thinking of... Uh, Plantain, my favorite food. That's mm, what I was thinking mm, of. Mm. What is platanos in Spanish America, plantain in, in Jamaica, plantain, you know, in different countries in Africa. This is a perfect example. Like everyone has a common food ways. Uh, there's a gentleman who's, who's black and Jewish and he's prominent on the Twitter circle. He does, he's, he's a, he does culinary uh, works from, from slavery. He recreated. Uh, is, is this the guy that uh, he, he had the Netflix Netflix yes. series? Yeah. Yes. Oh, great stuff. Great. That stuff. was great stuff. Yeah. That great. was great stuff. So even though there's different um, languages, cadence, even dialects, um, even across the U.S., you know, I'm from the West. Yeah. I sound much different than someone from the South. That's right. Right. Um, there are common commonalities. Music, to some extent, political political and worldview. And family structure. Right. Worldview, family structure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what what was the initial question? What was the process? Well, the initial question was a uh, process by which we took many African ethnicities and became one people. And while I was focused on African America, but one would say the same that, uh, you know, on uh, Saint Domingue, right. how did they become Haitian? Right. I think just generations, generations and time away from the source, right? Time away from the the the, the source. Um, that's going to change anyone. You see that with any immigrants that come to the country, to, that come to the U.S., for example. First, second generation, okay, they still understand the ties to home. By the time you get yeah. to the third generation, um, Michael Gomez says this so beautifully. He talks about how... Uh, African cultures were blending and mm -hmm. he says something about uh, the younger generation cannot experience Africa, but in the sound of their parents' voice. Yeah. He says something like that. It was beautiful, but yeah. that's also, you know, we're having, you know, more generations are being born and there's going to be more kind of a, uh, a assimil assimilation, not necessarily into a main majority culture, but commonalities amongst the people of African descent. You know, the, um, the number of Africans who have arrived in the U.S. since 1980 is much larger than the number of Africans who were brought as captives, right? Mm -hmm. and, and some of what we're seeing in that, and, 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 and when we look at that data is that, like you just said, that second generation, they begin to absorb African-American mm -hmm. culture. And by the third generation, 
Um, they, you know, they still have those, they, they have rituals and practices, but in the main, they have become uh, very much a part of uh, African-American, as well as they change African-American culture, right. because the culture must, uh, you know, adapt and take on the, the, the so some very important cultural revitalizations that come from uh, the different African populations mm -hmm. and Caribbean populations. But I, I want to go to something that the, the popular people might uh, yes. be more into, and that is historians on housewives. <laughs> you got to tell us what are you doing there? And it, it is pretty clear to me that what you're trying to get at, I think, when you say you're historicizing reality TV, which is something that is completely tied to this moment that um, Ernest Mandel termed late capitalism, and I refer to it as financialized global racial capitalism. You couldn't have had that shit in another moment. So talk about it. Well, Why? Let me, what is this? Well, I, let me start firstly by saying I, I, I've i always watched television. I've always, always liked to read. Maybe it was a kid growing up in, in Salt Lake City. I needed escapism. Um, I went to, as, as a junior scholar, I went to a, a talk that Deborah Gray White gave. It was probably at the Association of Black Women Historians meeting or something like that. And one of the things Deborah Gray White said was in order to uh, maintain your sanity in the profession, you need a hobby. For her, it was running. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what the other hobby was. We know for Nell Painter, it was knitting, crocheting. I stressed for years. I didn't have a hobby. So yeah, I did not have a hobby. Mm -hmm. I had no hobby. But I watched reality television. It wasn't until this podcast came along that I said, "Hey, I have I have a hobby. You do have a hobby. Yeah, yeah. I have expertise." So to be honest, the 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 concept of historians on Housewives isn't mine. It was brought to me by two grad students who are diehard historians, uh, uh, Bravo people, Bravo demics, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And we're in this moment where the um, American Historical Association and other organizations are declaring like a PhD in history is going to get you nowhere. So you need to think of alternative career paths. And I said, hey, this is a new directions. We got an NEH grant for this. Let's see where it goes. So really, I am the talent. <laughs> I am the talent. It's the students that are writing the script. It's a married couple. And they really are writing the script in a way that I learned, wait, you can't historicize this. So mm -hmm. our first episode was on this Bravo show called Southern Charm, which is all a bunch of um, um, elite whites. Um, one is descended from uh, John C. Calhoun. And mm -hmm. so the whole story is about how, you know, they're, you know, the kind of things that happen in reality TV, someone sleeps with someone, someone's cheating on someone else. She looked at me, I had, I was dressed the wrong way. And so we looked at these um, elite white people who descended from, you know, slaveholders. Yeah. And we were able then to say, okay, th what this doesn't tell us about Southern history is about the enslaved people mm -hmm. and the free blacks. And so it can be a teaching tool. You know, when you go in and you speak to our students, sometimes you got to get on their page. And so yeah. I've used reality TV and what I call my JMZ moments, not TMZ, JMZ, my JMZ moments where I come into class and say, okay, the JMZ moment today might be um, the North Dakota pipeline. And mm. how does that relate to our class on 19th century history? So I do it with African-American history as well. So I wish I could take credit and could tell you all about historicizing reality TV. For me, it was just pleasure. I didn't realize that there's actually a kind of critical underpinning until Real Housewives of Atlanta. And if you watch Real Housewives of Atlanta, you know, Portia Williams is uh, Hosea Williams' granddaughter. And there was a moment where they're in this church in Savannah and someone said, this was the site of the Underground Railroad. This was like one of the early sites of the Underground Railroad. And Portia, the granddaughter of Josiah Williams says, that looks small. They could get a train in there. Oh, what? So that was, you know, even someone even said, not a real train. 
So there was this moment, then you can talk about what does it mean for these civil rights legacies mm -hmm. and how this, this whatever you just called it, the capitalism, what kind of capitalism did you call it? Late capitalism. Yes. Yeah. What is it doing to progress? Well, Portia over a series of seasons redeems herself. And so when we get to the point of uh, marching on the Capitol, the United States Capitol, or we get to the point where during COVID, people are, are, are mobilizing in the wake of George Floyd's murder, Portia then is leading some campaigns in Atlanta um, 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 to assist Black Lives Matter. But, so but, but, but wait a minute now. There's a difference between her political consciousness to engage in contemporary struggle mm -hmm. versus what is a deep historical ignorance, historical amnesia, because that was that was painful to watch. Yes. the The other one that is deeply ahistorical is. Um, uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta, Kenya Moore, who was the first Black Miss USA, who actually grew up with our former colleague, Brandy Shatines. Really? <laughs> yes. So See, she's Nancy from the, the Black Radical City. Yes. So she had a thing in her first second, first or second season where she, that she made popular saying, honey, I am fabulous. I am gone with the wind fabulous. What the hell does that oh, mean? Wow. What the hell does that mean? Well, you must know, Sundiata Adachajua, I went to the first ever Bravo, and maybe only BravoCon con, uh, conference in New York City hmm. in 2019. And you must know, while Portia and Kenya were on stage, you must know I launched my questions. Yes, yes, you did. So go ahead, share that moment, please. Well, and this I, is a JM. This is a JMZ moment. <laughs> yes. So really my question was for Cynthia Bailey. Cynthia Bailey sh shares a child with uh, the 1990s heartthrob, Leon. Remember Leon from yeah, the yeah, Five yeah. Heartbeats? Leon. Oh, yeah. Le no, no. You remember Leon Temptations. He played David Ruffin. Yes. He played the Leon. hell out of David Ruffin. Leon. Exactly. Yes. Yes. People Ruffin, the love greatest singer Leon. of all time. Yes. People loved Leon, right? I didn't see it at first in my younger years. As I've gotten older, I'm like, oh, Leon. So my question was really as a woman of a certain age, like, you know, is Leon single? Let's get to the business. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, this there was more of a, you know, there's always a performance with me. I said, but while I'm here, I am, you know, a host of a, a, a podcast called Historians on Housewives. We critically look at reality housewives against historical um, backdrops. I said, Portia, Kenya, you might want to get at us. And they both just sat there for a minute. And Portia's like, oh, Underground Railroad. Kenya got herself up and proceeded to try and tell me and the whole audience, the audience that ate it up, how she got that from Hattie McDaniel, the first Black woman to, uh, to win an Oscar. And Gone with the Wind Fabulous is her version, her ode to Hattie McDaniel. Really? Please. Really? That's and even if you got it from yeah. Hattie McDaniel, that doesn't make a backward notion, you know, That's acceptable just because it came it. from she another black from, person. She hmm. got it from the Southern skirts because she was twirling. She didn't say Hattie McDaniel. She said Gone with the Wind Fabulous. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we talk about those kind of things. By the third time I asked questions, the Bravo, Bravo producers told me to sit down. What? <laughs> I'm sure they did. You need me. I, I suspect that you uh, didn't make the, uh, the the tape that you. you, you <laughs> I didn't, but oh ho ho! When we got oh this cast of Southern Charm, the the white people I told you about, they were in the first session, and I was going to say something about family history. I wasn't really going to put them on the spot. I wasn't. I, I it was early. I wasn't going to put them on the spot. It was too easy. But, yeah. It was too easy. I stood up to ask some question. I introduced myself, and out of nowhere, the ancestors came forth and was like, so as people who are descended from slave holders, I don't even remember what I asked. I don't I don't know what came out of me. That's not what I rehearsed with my colleague. You know, j is going to be j -Mail, and then you're going to have the ancestors. Mm -hmm. So what happened was there actually was a, a conversation where one of the guys who's descended from Mary Boynton Chestnut, 
who has who authored one of these important journals of these white women that um, authored a journal in early America. He actually talked about, well, I learned that one of my ancestors was Mary Chestnut Boykin. And he began, he he engaged it. And the descendant of John C. Calhoun engaged it. So Bravo does use that in their promos. I've cut, been hmm. cut out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. I was right. cut out, but they're answering my question. So I think that the, the, to answer your question, I don't know what to tell you about Housewives as a phenomenon. I think that people need extreme escapism. Um, most of the people on the shows aren't housewives at, at all anymore. Yeah. Um, what our edited volume does is it historicize housewives and housewifery, like the 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 industry of of making things in the home. Mm -hmm. And so we contextualize that. We have Marsha Chatterline, who's a uh, one of Pulitzer Prize. She actually is a Bravo demic. She wrote about um, um, the hot dog industry and and Real Housewives of Atlanta and Portia Williams. Hmm. Uh, Tanisha Ford talked about uh, fashion and turn of the century, 19th century women in, in Washington and, and Potomac, Maryland. So, and we also have someone who does, we had two people who write on medieval history, linking it to the performance of Christianity in some of these uh, uh, shows. So there's connections I didn't even realize were there. I, but, really, you know, I, I think the important thing that you're doing is making it clear and reminding people that we can historicize anything and there's nothing that's quote unquote irrelevant and insignificant because mm -hmm. we can draw meaning. And that's really the role of the historian is to extract the meaning. Yes, that's place. exactly what I'm doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for helping me with that. I, I know you well enough that I know you're on your best behavior. You are on your best behavior today. I know you well enough that you're gonna you're gonna walk away from this and say, and then this woman. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> look, look, and so here we we're going to the lightning round. Right. I know you. There's more oh, coming. Yeah. But we're gonna do this and uh, then we'll take some questions. Okay. But the lightning round is I want you to just react to uh, these phenomena that have occurred recently. So um, first will be Katanji Brown Jackson. Just what comes to your mind? Not a black woman in the world didn't understand when she was trying to hold herself together when she listened to those stupid questions. Every black woman in any power position understood she needed just we understood her reaction and I'm so, and, and she persevered and Hey, what can we say? A Delta with locks is now on the highest court of land. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you mean from lightning round? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. What I remember um, most from those hearings is her trying to hold her cool and not, they were just vicious. And you know, you want to contrast that with uh, the devil's child, Clarence. Uh, as, as Amir Baraka would call him, Tom S. Clarence, and his response during his questioning? No. <laughs> he don't deserve I that. I let the evidence speak for itself. <laughs> okay. So now, SCOTUS's uh, draft opinion nullifying Roe v. Wade. I've been depressed for two weeks. I don't know if it's because I... Um, I do slave women who didn't have any power over their own bodies back then. I have been depressed. I think that it is a bad precedence to set if, if they overturn Roe v. Wade. You know, it's like that old saying, um, when they came for the communists, mm -hmm. no one spoke up. When they came, then they came for me and no one spoke up. I think that women's wounds, uh, uh, people of color in general, just insert definitely gay marriage. I think it is a bad yeah. precedence. I think it's a bad precedence and I've been very depressed. You know, I think the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is right there on the cutting block right now. I think so too. Because the, the links are, are, are clear, unenumerated. But you know what shocked me most about that? And I'm ashamed to say that I was shocked, but it's, it's a footnote. And the footnote goes something like this. The domestic production of infants is is, is down. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, are we talking about like 
producing cars and, and fruit. I mean, what the hell are we talking about here? Well, remember the early 20th century, then even Du Bois kind of, Du Bois and Margaret Sanger kind of became um, um, allies in a certain sense mm -hmm. that Margaret Sanger said, you know, women should be able to control their wombs. And Du Bois was leaning a little bit into that talented tent that may be eugenics, that, you know, only the mm -hmm. best parts of our civilization should um, populate. You know, I mean, he didn't yeah. say that, but it's, it's, it's really tangential to eugenics. I think yeah, we're in yeah, dangerous yeah. territory, yeah. but I think we're in dangerous territory. Yeah, we, we, we absolutely are in dangerous territory. All right, so um, Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. How much? And, and I hate to go to silly town, but how much time people you are on it? Um, you, you've got maybe three minutes. Will Smith has a history of slapping people. Several years ago, he slapped a guy who tried to kiss him while he was on the red carpet. It was someone posing as a reporter, and he tried to kiss Will Smith, and Will Smith slapped him, just slapped him, you know, and you know, people from the streets look at those slaps several different ways. Yeah. Um, if you believe the notion that he got up after Jada got a look, gave him a look, okay, okay. Um, I have a different, I actually have a different take. Okay, at that, your point, take? at that point in LA history, there has been an exhibit on Tupac, um, Tupac, Wake Me When I'm Free, phenomenal exhibit. Um, and Tupac's billboards are all over the city of Los Angeles. Hmm. So Will Smith has already been humiliated because his wife had been in an, an entanglement. He's coming and he's driving into the city of Los Angeles. Wait a minute, and his daughter wrote that letter to Tupac about how she missed Tupac and she never met Tupac. Was that in the exhibit? I didn't see it, but there are letters from Jada. Now the exhibit well, has from everything he's ever read, written, and so I was on skim mode. So I don't know if it's in the exhibit. Okay. But Will Smith is coming from his house in Thousand Oaks or whatever it is, and he's coming into the city and there's billboards of Tupac everywhere. Best night of his life, there's these videos, there's these billboards with Tupac. He goes into the uh, arena. Next thing you know, they're talking about Jada. He's already been emasculated about her entanglement. She looks at him. He's like, shit, now I got to go act. I got to do something. Yeah. But he chose to slap him, not punch him. Because I think that right. if he punched yeah. him, there'd be a situation. Okay. But I also think, you know, there's some people, um, uh, gender nonconformists, et cetera, et cetera, who are questioning his sexuality. Um, all I will say about his sexuality is Will and Jada have been swingers for years. I was in grad school and I knew about this because um, I went to UCLA. And also, no, he, he went on television and said that. And he, right, but before he did that, before he did that, <laughs> okay, before he scooped me. But you know, there's accounts that you know the the difference between Jada and Will is Will has his people sign non disclosures. That's the difference. So mm. they're both out in these streets. And I think in that moment, he just was trying to protect his manhood. I think if he goes on the, the Hollywood uh, 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 repent tour, checks himself into anger management, yeah. has a beer summit with Chris, you know, a beer summit with Chris Rock, I think it'll go away. Okay. All right. This last one is, uh, I think, a heavy one because all of our communities are being, uh, are experiencing this at, at uh, unprecedented levels, gun violence. I wish it was just as simple as um, gun laws in the U.S. I mean, we're talking about the we're talking about structural inequality and incredible privilege at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's black on black violence, but people like to use that example when some disaffected white child who hasn't had enough therapy goes and shoots up a, a movie theater. I think it's much more complicated than the right to bear arms. And that's a that's a sad child. Dylan Roof, the young man who shot up the church in South Carolina, right? Yeah. He is he is a troubled child. And is he the one that they bought McDonald's for? Yeah. 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 And a black Stop person. Going away. Got yeah, a going. black person who is in no way, in no way associated with a crime, reaches for their driver's license and they're shot. So I think there's black on black violence. I think there's police violence. I think there's uh, vigilante violence, or I'm sorry, troubled children violence. <laughs> okay.
good because you know normally people go straight to these young black males so appreciate that all right jessica yes i'm going to uh search the chat for questions and if you have a question now is the moment to put it in the chat oh lord so let, let me go up uh oftentimes uh people make comments as opposed to right you know this this is our you know how we are as a people so i'm waiting Okay, well, one says that they heard that there's a Housewives of uh, Lagos. Yes. Uh, have you? Can you say something about that? So you can't, How does it differ? If well, it does? You, can't, you can't get access to Lagos from the U.S. You have to have some other channel called Star Max. But what I have watched is um, uh, the Housewives of Durban and the Housewives of Johannesburg. Same, similar scripts. There's going to be an altercation because someone gossiped about someone. Someone's husband isn't doing right by them. I mean, there's a formula. Right, right. There's a formula for these. Um, so I can't speak about Lagos only because we don't have access to it yet in the U.S. But I'm going to be tuning in. Okay, there's um, I'm, I'm kind of pulling this out. And one is, uh, it appears to be about the role of religion in the raids of villages that led to captives. They don't flesh it out, so okay. do what you can with it. Okay. Um, when we think about, when I think about, it depends on what we're talking about. It's a little bit more complicated than religion. Are we talking about different African worldviews? And, and different groups um, 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 raiding other villages? Are we talking about Christians? Um, I don't think I know the answer because I don't understand the, the question. Yeah, yeah, the question just says religions did raids too. I, I think probably the colonialist uh, project that Christianity in particular brought to the continent, maybe that, maybe that. I mean, we definitely know in the founding of Liberia and anything backed by you know um the maryland the maryland yeah. the american colonization society yeah, yeah. The, there are christian aspects that then just kind of replicate settler colonialism so i don't know if that was the question that's the best i can do okay now here's a question i don't even know if i should ask it but because it's probably more aimed at me than you <laughs> but um they asked how did kevin samuels hate black people and I think I personally amended it to say that he largely hated black women, but I took it as us in totality. But do you want to respond to that? Um, Kevin Samuels did what often men have no business doing, talking about black women and how black women live their lives. He ran attacks on our wombs or mor our, our morality, um, how we how we spoke, how we speak, how we dress. Um, these are just facts. These aren't opinions. If a group of aliens came down to Earth and they wanted to find out about black women and they uh, interviewed Kevin Samuel, they'd be done with black women. Yes. Period. Period. And he got rich off that platform. Let's be clear. He got rich off that platform. So we don't want to speak ill of the dead, but at the same time. Mm. OK, here's a question that uh, I'm, I'm gonna take it as a critique of okay. uh, the show <clears throat> in black power media in general, right? Cause uh -oh. the show is on black power media. So this sounds like you're stopping it. You're stopping it. Says, Hashtag black power media. Why do you think the black community isn't talk, isn't taking the extreme behavior of white nationalists and supremacist groups in America as a danger like our ancestors did. I think we are. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> yeah. I think we are. I think the fact that when people get pulled over, you know, people are sweating bullets. There was just a thing on um, one of the internet channels, the YouTubes, about a young man that was so nervous when he got pulled over that he can't even articulate anything. But eventually when he calmed down, he's like, yeah, my whole family's in law enforcement. I need your badge number. I need this, I need that. But 
initially he was afraid because historically we know that the patrollers the people who patrolled neighborhoods and plantations mm -hmm. were, were the people that also became members of um the kkk i mean there's a rich history i think we are i think people are very scared you know I, uh, for some reason uh, maybe it needs to be crystallized but when we're talking about uh, racial terrorism, we're talking about the state and its yeah. repressive apparatus, but we're also yeah. talking about white vigilantes. Yes. And you know, one of my theories is that um, as we have pressed the state and the police murders of black people has decreased significantly since 2013, right? So, uh, and, and in fact, Last year, in 2019, no, in 2020, there was something like 243 black people killed by police, right? And that constituted nearly 24% of all people killed by police. Mm -hmm. In 2021, the number dropped to 139. Now, I attribute that to, and it represented 13.1% of all police killings. I attribute that to the protests that came out of the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Now, how does the white community respond? White vigilantes start killing black people. That's what we're dealing with. Yeah, all you have to do is look at the feed on some of these videos um, of, of some of the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, all you have to do is read the comments and white vigilantism is, 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 is large and in charge. I think people are very scared. And I think they're responding. You know that the fastest growing group in terms of buying guns is black folk and particularly Absolutely. black women. Absolutely. You know, buy guns, you know um, my partner, Helen, was a no gun person mm -hmm. up until uh, last year. So when I said, you know, babe, it's, 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 it's time for you to rethink that, she said, go, 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 go. <laughs> I mean, I was raised around guns. I was raised in Salt Lake City, so it was a hunting, right? I, I yeah. was raised around the right to bear arms. So it never occurred to me to have a gun, even though, you know, I've lived alone for a long time. But I'll tell you what, the last few years, I thought maybe I need to go to the gun range. My sister knows how to shoot a gun. I don't. But I've been thinking maybe I need to learn. Well, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. You do. I do. You do. So yeah. let me say, I, not I've been thinking, I need to get my ass to a gun range. That's, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Get your permit and your conceal and carry. These white folks are out of their goddamn minds. Okay, someone, comrade Kwame, and you've got, I'm showing three minutes, and then we're going to wrap it up. Well, you got two okay. minutes. Two minutes, and we're going to wrap it up. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting this right, but it says court just struck down California 21 yeah. and under ban as unconstitutional. Loop me in and react this, to it. Is this, I don't, I don't know it by the number. Are you talking about um, the state of California um, giving reparations to people who, who uh, might've been enslaved? The way I interpret, I think that's what it is. Okay, I thought I thought that they issued the report, right? But yeah, they're they not that the report, report is calling for it, but right. the report was us. <laughs> you know, we did right. this report. The, uh, I think actually, the legislature I think hasn't Apple, approved it, right? Did some research for it. I guess I don't. Uh, a radio show asked me to speak on it, and I still don't know enough because I think when you look at the law. I don't know enough. I'll leave it as I don't know enough. I hope to learn more. Okay, he's saying, uh, he's saying no. Uh, what he said is that no, 21 years and under can buy guns. Oh, see, I didn't even know that. You can tell okay. I live in early America. Yeah. I didn't yeah, know that, that but I don't, I don't think it's good. I've been writing, so I haven't paid attention to the news. Dr. Millward, Jessica, a different. It, it was a pleasure having you here, and I truly appreciate it. And I am in your debt. We will see each other again at the next Asala. There you go, Montgomery, Alabama. We're going to the Lynching Museum. Absolutely. Yeah, I probably won't be in Montgomery, but I'll see you Oswald in 2023 in Ghana. All right. <laughs> I forgot it was Montgomery. <laughs> okay.
All right, this has been uh, Sundia Tachachu, a host of Real Talk History as a Weapon on the Black Power Media Network. And again, we want to thank Dr. Millward for coming.